Hey, so quickly before the video starts, I wanted to tell you that this is essentially a continuation of my video from last week. So if you haven't seen that, I would recommend watching it before you watch this. Nevertheless, you should be fine with not understanding some of the things I talk about, and yeah, you should be okay. Lots has happened after the release of Life is Strange. Most notably, it was turned into a franchise with merch coming out, comics, a prequel game, and very consistent rumors of a movie or a show. But my personal biggest question for the future of Life is Strange was a fundamental one. Was this franchise going to be about time travel, teen drama, or superpowers in general? Well, the prequel game we got two years after the first game didn't really answer this question. It focused on Chloe and took place many years before the first game. Now, don't get me wrong, I enjoyed playing through it, but I can only describe the whole experience as, well, superfluous. We didn't really learn anything new about anything that meaningful or about any of the characters. But yes, it was nice to spend some more time in Arcadia Bay. The answer to my question would come a year later in the form of The Awesome Adventures of Captain Spirit a free playable teaser for Life is Strange 2. It was a very small, contained story that only gave us a few hints on what was going to happen next in the franchise, and made many of the fans wonder about the connections it could be drawing to the first game. But yes, my question was finally answered. Life is Strange is a franchise about superpowers. Well nice, I'm up for that. So then let's finally move on to the actual game. Since graphics are the first thing I talked about in the last video, I thought I'd start this one off with a similar structure. If you remember, I praised the first Life is Strange game for using its low-budget graphics to their advantage through many clever workarounds. Obviously, with this being a sequel, I automatically expected a jump in the quality of the graphics, and must admit that I am hugely let down. I didn't expect it to look crazy different, but I'd honestly argue that it, at times, looks slightly worse than Life is Strange 1. A now four-year-old game. I just don't quite understand what the artistic goal was here. It's clearly trying to look more realistic than the first game, but still absolutely can't afford to do so with the given budget. So instead it needs to use the same health measures as the first game, but does so less smartly. Another reason for the rough state of the graphics could be the simple fact that due to this game being a road trip based one, there's a lot more different environments and characters that need to be rendered out, therefore increasing the strain on both devs and fans. My personal solution to this would be to again go with a more stylized route, since the main character enjoys drawing a lot. Maybe a slightly cel-shaded look with some clear drawing influences would have fit. This would both make it look fresh, as well as more clearly distinguish it from the first game by tying it to the protagonist once more. I know, I know, I know, but listen, just... SHUT UP! Thank you. Usually, I'm not one of those people crying about how politics have no place in video games and need to be gotten rid of. Even the first Life is Strange, which arguably wasn't about politics at all, had some interesting things to say about the dangerous privileges of money and status. But the politics in Life is Strange are just so messy. To start off, the game is clearly referencing the unjust treatment of Mexican immigrants in the US, as well as police brutality and generally racist behavior in its first episode alone. I have a lot of problems with this. Firstly, the whole game is based around Sean and his brother fearing deportation, but aggressive mass deportation has only become the shocking problem it is now after Trump's election. This game takes place a month before he was elected. I understand Sean and Daniel would want to run away in fear of the police misinterpreting the events. But given the fact that this took place in a well-inhabited area, there's bound to at least be some form of witness that could clear them of their faults. And even if not, given their age and other circumstances, deportation is the last thing they should fear. 
especially since they are both American citizens who were born there. Next, when I see characters like the crazy old man wanting to murder a 16-year-old boy just because he's Mexican, I kinda lose interest in a story very quickly. Many have tried to explain to me why this is unfair, as people like that man do exist in real life and situations similar to what happens in the episode do occur. But this is not an excuse for the story feeling offbeat and unnaturally dramatized. The game can't try to be this raw depiction of terrible acts that happen in reality and jump to a fantastical superpower journey in the next minute. Of course, there have been superhero stories that managed to merge the two very well in the past, but the way Life is Strange 2 does this keeps the two story elements basically cannibalizing each other. The advantage the first game had in regards to its political statements was that it took place in a fictional American town. The writers and developers, who are all French by the way, use this to create this idolized but also exaggerated caricature of the American lifestyle. But now that their message has become more serious, it all kind of falls apart. I'm in no way accusing them of not having done their research, as I know well that they have traveled throughout America many, many times, and I appreciate them trying to bring such an important and difficult topic to this medium. I just wish they wouldn't have gone about it this way. Also, this isn't in the script, but I did want to mention it, so in the first video I talked about how the first game gave you the possibility of um, romancing Chloe, because Chloe is a lesbian, and uh, you could also possibly romance Warren. It was kind of, there was kind of an in-between, because, and it fit, you know, the character of Max, because she was a very indecisive person that kept doubting who she was herself. I mean, to me, I think it was pretty clear that at the end she was more attracted to women, especially the last episode talked about her kind of not being able to trust men and not really being attracted to them. So it kind of fits into that game that, you know, she was doubting her sexuality. The thing with, like, the sexuality in this game the political representation of LGBT people in this game is that it doesn't fit Sean's character to be undecisive about his sexuality. He isn't discovering himself. He's running away with his brother, he's in a very serious situation, so it doesn't really make sense for Sean to be this blank slate. And I think that really hurts the writing. They're trying to be progressive, they're trying to be political, with Sean, you know, also being, I guess, bisexual, but it doesn't work. <laughs> he, yeah, it doesn't make sense for his character. So I'm just gonna put this in now. In the previous section, we already discussed much of what happens in the first episode, so now we know the basis of the story. The plot will be a cross between a road trip and a coming of age story of two brothers. Is it just me, or is the setup really flat? The tale of two brothers traveling through a country is something I've seen and heard just a little bit too often in video games, and it's not like the game adds a lot more elements than that. What does get added usually falls away after one episode. Not that the first Life is Strange was somehow a fountain of originality, but this is as thin as it gets. By the way, I do realize criticizing a game for its story when it currently isn't concluded might seem dodgy, but since the first four episodes of Life is Strange 1 are, in my opinion, much better than the last, I think now is as good of a time as ever. Originally, this video was gonna be kind of a bit longer, with me listing my problems with each and every episode of the game, but I don't think this game deserves that. It's still good, just absolutely not what I had expected. So instead, let's just highlight the main issues with the writing. Because you are spending all of your playtime with Sean and Daniel, the relationship needed to be interesting, complex, and witty. But sadly, the writers don't achieve any of this, and that's a huge detriment to the plot. There's no nuance to be found. They are either mad at each other, or they're not. Daniel is either the creepy superpower child, or he isn't. The two brothers never really break out of their assigned cliches. The first game also loved using tropes and cliches, 
But even though you spend most of your time with two characters in that game as well, the inhabitants of Arcadia Bay were living and changing around you. It's ironic then that this story, all about running away into an uncertain adventure, feels so linear and constricted. The few reoccurring characters don't live around you, they merely jump in your way when the game wants them to and then just disappear. The game doesn't truly have a cast. This causes the game to have this odd stop and go feeling. A great example of what I mean by this comes with the latest episode. The fact that the need to throw all that religious cult stuff into episode 4 is indicative of how unfocused and confused the story is. It's also incredibly forced. Since when is religion one of the themes of Life is Strange 2? Well it is now. And let me tell you, saying religion bad in 2019 has got to be one of the most boring things you can do with your video game. Also, it's cool that the brother's mother just randomly finds them, but... what? Lastly, and I think this is my biggest problem with the game, is the complete lack of a mystery. In the first game, the two central mysteries, namely Rachel Amber's disappearance and the inherent mystery of Max's time powers, tied a neat bow around the plot. Whenever it had wandered a bit too much, it always could go back to continue unveiling more. Life is Strange 2 doesn't really have that. Daniel's powers aren't tied to any other plot elements, really. He's just a mutant from X-Men. Something traumatic happens and he has powers now, and I think that's my biggest gripe, honestly. I don't have questions to the world of Life is Strange 2. There's nothing I want to know more about or find out. I guess we'll see what happens in the final episode coming this December. Maybe it'll all make sense by then. But I'm not gonna hold my breath. <laughs> uh, anyway, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for having joined me on this overlook of uh, both Life is Strange games. Uh, I hope you enjoyed. I hope it was kind of insightful. Um, if you did, like and subscribe. Do all that shell out, sell out stuff so I can, you know, keep doing this. And I'll see you in a bit. Uh, this is actually my last video of September. I'm going to take a little bit of a break because I'm going back to Germany. But yeah, I'll see you on the other side. Also, short teaser, I am going to make content about Portalands 3. A lot of it. And also, there's going to be a very fucked up video coming. Like, very fucked up. Be ready. <laughs>